So good morning, everybody. Uh, today, I'm just going to talk very briefly about uh, building a task queue in GenStage and also uh, using Actual and PostgreSQL. So um, it's going to have seven major parts in it. Um, the outline is below. So first of all, I'm going to talk about mostly the use cases that, uh, that we ourselves were facing uh, before, uh, before deciding to build such a task queue. Then um, I'll spend some time talking about some basic scheduling concepts that may actually help you analyze the tasks and also other workloads in your system before uh, deciding to build a queue, because you may find that uh, depending on the type of task in your system, the, the design of the queues need to be very different, or it may not need to be a queue at all. Um, after that, uh, we'll talk about actually designing such a system using Elixir. Uh, after you have done the, such an analysis. Then I'll spend some time talking about um, one topic, which is also very important, which is regulating usage of certain resources that are easily exhaustible or not easy to replenish in your system. After that, uh, if there's still more time, I'll spend some, some additional time talking about monitoring your system and also on how the system can be scaled in the future as your usage level grows. Then finally, if there is still time, I'll talk about, uh, talk about the future state, i.e. what uh, we have learned, uh, what we have tried to find, and haven't been able to find, so how to build ourselves, and so on. So um, I do expect, at least um, in my personal opinion, that after this talk, you should have a very good understanding of how to design tasks and also how to design queues, or in this case, I call them executors. With, uh, especially with a focus on using them within web applications, because web applications do bring with them a different set of constraints. Um, we'll talk a little bit also about how certain components that we have used in this system actually behaves, um, and also on how, uh, how you might want to use them in different contexts and how these different contexts may impact your operations. Lastly, I'll post some code snippets as, as required, but and the bits that you already see all the, all the places uh, in blog posts will be probably skipped because for brevity reasons. So on the use cases, um, we have at least um, a couple of Elixir applications, but, but the primary one has these use cases. So it's a document system. So of course, when documents were uploaded in like first time into the system, they have to be processed. Because when, when the binary is uploaded to the system, it's just a, um, just a binary blob. You really don't know what's in it. You have to actually introspect it and then find the correct type uh, that's supposed to be the type of a binary file and then process the document according to that type. Because the alternative would be to send a document to all the processors at once and, at once and see which one returns the result, which is not practical. So. The second uh, use case here is that when we deal with migrations or deal with ingestion of data from other sources, we have to have some kind of an ingestion queue because there may be thousands to millions of documents in these external systems and we don't want to run them synchronously. Sometimes they, these systems actually go down for maintenance or they disappear for a bit when we're doing our imports. We want, them, we want the workflow to be resumable. Um, Second major use case is that sometimes you have several users looking at a document and they want it to collaborate. When they do so, they expect changes made by a certain user to be available in a different place right away, and that can be done via fanouts. But when you have multiple servers, you have to have some way of coordinating them. So no matter where, uh, where the website connection is held, like on which server, all of them get the same information. And also other many uses. Um, so my team basically does mostly uh, commercial work for, for a company. So because we got a document platform, we got some kind of uh, cost work collection system uh, with also with binary inspection because people sometimes pretend to have uploaded a file, but the file actually is corrupt and, and you know, they, they act innocuous. And also we run everything that we built. So it's not only better supported, but also we accumulate operational experience as the products were created before handing it off to other people in the future. Uh, sometimes we write small components for other teams. And also, uh, currently we have three team members, but uh, we're all active in the open source community. Anyway, so, so now 
without further ado, let's talk about basic scheduling concepts. So when, when you talk about tasks, the real, the real important question here is what is a deadline? So generally speaking, the task deadlines can be soft, can be firm, or can be hard. A task with a soft deadline is something that if missed, people may be unhappy, but really, really no harm is done. So is it applicable to web applications? The answer is yes, because most web application operations are fall within that boundary. So there's another case which is a firm deadline. The firm deadline is something like, uh, if you tell your boss you're going to send a weekly report by Friday, but you didn't do so, then you have missed a firm deadline. The results may be useless if you miss the deadline, but still no harm is done. The, the worst, in the worst case, you, you do it again. And maybe some other stuff will be delayed, but it's fine. In, in case of a hard deadline, um, although I use a case which is to guide missiles, um, hard deadlines can also be seen somewhere else, like in audio production, where if you miss a single buffer, uh, the audio output will be glitched. So hard deadlines, if missed, will cause very bad things. And I have categorized hard deadlines as something that's not applicable to our applications at the moment. So another thing is with the idea of deadlines in mind, you can then look at how tasks can be scheduled. So in this case, if you were to look uh, outside of web application development, you can see that there are many ways to schedule tasks. Uh, in the first case, if you if you know exactly what tasks are to be run in system and, what, um, and you know exactly when their results are expected, you can then, well, look at all the deadlines, look at all the periods, i.e. how frequently does a task need to be run, and derive a hand-built schedule. So the schedule is something like, I have from start to finish 10,024 slots. And in the first five slots, I'll do this task. In the next five slots, I'll do that task, and so on and so on. So every time somebody tells you, hey, we have a new task, you will be very unhappy because you have to redo the schedule. And if, some, and if a task were to die in the middle of execution of that schedule, then bad things may happen. You may be able to restart from scratch, or, well, maybe, maybe it will just come all crashing down. So, so that's uh, kind of... Um, the approach that we, we don't want to take at the moment, in, at least inside web applications. Uh, the second approach is more of a popular approach, which is time sharing. I assign each task by importance, like task A has 35% of CPU time, task B has 25% of CPU time, task C has 10%, and then you just context switch between them. This is how um, most uh, operating, operating systems operate right now. So this is fine, as long as you don't have a huge amount of tasks. When you have a huge amount of tasks, doing this is going to cause contention. So, so that's why now you can you can schedule tasks by priority, and when you schedule tasks by priority, uh, priorities of each task can be determined either ahead of time by the, by, the, by the programmer, or it can actually be dynamically determined. So, uh, scheduler sees a lot of tasks, and scheduler decides which tasks to run first instead of running all the highs and and then all the mids and all the lows. You probably the scheduler probably want to run some some lows and some mids. Right. So, so these are the uh, these are traditional approaches to scheduling tasks in a priority-driven manner. So, in practice, uh, as I said, this is a talk geared towards uh, web application development. So, in practice, if something is slow. Um, if it's not a web application, it's going to be taken seriously. You may have to rework a system. Otherwise, you may just, you know, just wait until it's fast, fast again if, if it's not a problem. In case of breaches, in this case, uh, when a task doesn't run before the deadline, i.e. something is supposed to happen at 12 o'clock, but it didn't happen, it happened at 12.05. Is it serious? Will you get sued? Maybe, but usually you won't. You just apologize on Twitter. So the last thing is validation. How are you sure that all the tasks can be run inside your system within an available, uh, within available time? Um, well, with web application development, probably you run it on your laptop and you run it for 20 minutes. It doesn't seem to be problematic, so you push it out to production. So what I'm trying to say here is that at least in the world we operate in, the um, tolerance for faults or errors or human error or machine error in general is drastically higher than other worlds. And this is both a good and bad thing, but at least for the purposes of today, this means that um, if we apply learning from other fields to web application development, then we should be able to do a much better job and our application should be healthy all the time, at least to web application standards. Another thing is that web applications run on servers, and sometimes servers are now in the cloud. So, so there is a 
there's also a difference between old and new world mindset. If you look at certain queuing systems uh, implementations, you will find that they're designed for a fixed amount of servers. If you look at something that's more scalable, it will, the design may look very different. So the aspects, um, there are three aspects I, I want to talk about. The first one, in the old world, usually you run the workload on premises. So when you want a new server, you have to sign a form, argue with people for two months, and then you get a new server, and then you have to actually install it. In a new world, it's usually cloud. Uh, of course, where the money comes from is different. So also, in inter uh, also there is a case of intervention. So in the old world, you probably have more time to tweak your code until you're fixing memory or fixing the server. In the new world, you get a new or a larger server, or you get two or you get four servers until until the code runs again. So again, this is something that's uh, more or less you know more or less special about our field. So again, the point is that we should be able to do a much better job with the drastically loosened constraints of our world. And with that, I'll start talking about the actual design of task systems in such a world. So of course, the first thing is uh, we have to actually classify and design the tasks again with what we have learned. So. I have you say different classification system here. In web applications, tasks are in general either one-off or periodic. One-off means that it runs once. Periodic means that it has to run periodically. But one-off tasks can either you know be unordered or serial. So the thing here is, uh, a one-off unordered task is, for example, when I make an order, send a notification email. So it doesn't matter if the order is canceled later, you send another email later. So this particular task doesn't vanish simply because the state of the order has changed. So can it be paralyzed? The answer is yes, easily, because it doesn't matter it doesn't matter what the actual state of that thing is. Uh, the task has to run, and it has to run according to the arguments, uh, the arguments given to the task at the start or say at the creation time of a task. So that's the easiest thing to parallelize, and probably the low ha lowest hanging fruit for you. Uh, in case of a one of zero task, one of the examples would be this service has subscribed to updates against this particular resource. So anytime this resource changes, send an update to this service. Well, there are ways to do it without, without actually having to run these tasks in, uh, you know, in a serial manner. You may just use CRDTs, and, and then you tell, you tell every single customer, hey, now, from now on, you resolve our CRDTs. Or sometimes they probably they probably either can't or don't want to do that. So in this case, you have to send them in order and you know, send one message, make sure it's received, and then send another message, and so on. And of course, with that comes an entirely different world of challenges and issues, like, oh, this customer is slow because they turned the server off for two days. Now our queue is back up, but it's not our problem. What can we do? So, so these are issues specific to one-off and serial tasks. Uh, the last thing I want to talk about is periodic or batch tasks. So this is basically your old cron task, really. Uh, the only difference here is that cron tasks affect uh, a single server only, usually, because cron is configured on a server. So you probably want to do something so each server in the cluster can do its own share of periodic tasks. Otherwise, you will have a case where one server is more important than others, which is a violation of the cattle principle, where each server should be independently replaced, at least the application servers. So of course, the periodic tasks are harder to parallelize, but still, there are ways to do so. So. I'm just going to skip the text version. It's uh, embedded for later PDF export. Another, uh, another thing that you want to talk about probably is cancellation, i.e., can a task be canceled uh, in the future? Because in certain cases, certain notifications should not be sent after ever some, some state has changed. But in certain cases, you don't want the task to be canceled. So whether a task can be canceled isn't only a matter of uh, designing the actual worker, i.e. return if state is not x, uh, but also the consideration of a task execution system, because these tasks, although they ultimately didn't affect uh, in anything, they still occupy slots in your task queue. So you will basically see a lot of churn where you know every single task is run, but for a very small fraction of time only, because uh, they run and they check the state of the underlying object, and then since the tasks weren't actually retracted from the queue, um, they're still in the queue and occupying space. So repetition. 
So if you have something that seems to be periodic, you should really just do it as a periodic task. Also, the last thing is retrying. So I did touch briefly on firm versus soft deadlines earlier. So in case of a firm deadline, it's something that if you didn't do it, then the results are useless. You have to do it again in the future. So this, ha this is interrelated with, uh, with the question of whether you should retry a task even. If you retry, how do you retry it? Do you retry exponentially? Do you retry a space uh, constantly? Or do you retry it by some other, man some other manner? And what happens if something just straight out fails and never succeeds? You, this is when you want to intervene. Anyway, these will be, uh, these will be questions uh, relevant to your own system only, really. So now, let's talk about the other thing, creating one-off tasks. This is when it gets interesting, because code is going to show up. So, so there are, again, three ways to make one-off tasks. You can make it from the application, but you do it in a separate transaction, assuming that you use a, you use a jobs table, or you maybe, maybe you use Redis, or maybe you use some other data store, which is not your database to do it. Well, it is eminently scalable, because it doesn't impact your actual, uh, your actual database master instance that you're writing to, but it probably isn't consistent, and it's a robust, probably, but probably not, because now you actually have two systems of record, really, one for the data and one for the jobs. So the other use case would be, well, let's do it in a very big transaction then. So you hold the transaction, and then, and then you do your work, and then you queue the job. Keep the transaction open, of course, un until, you do, until you queue the job, and then close the transaction. So is it scalable? It is less scalable, because now each transaction has to run for longer. But is it consistent? The answer is yes. It is very consistent, because it is, it's in the same transaction. If for some reason the commit fails, then both the job and the mutation to the data will not appear. So it is consistent and also is robust. Uh, however, the question is, will somebody try to change something in your database without going through your application? Uh, it may happen, and it can happen as your, as your scope grows. There is going to be less and less of a notion of a central database and a central team that manages the database. Sometimes the DBAs are different people from developers, from the operators, and sometimes, uh, sometimes you just you know you go on vacation and when you come back everything broke because somebody else didn't read your documentation although you wrote them. So there's a way around that by by using triggers. Although you can still circumvent triggers, which I'll talk about later. So again, if you do something that's one off and you do it outside of your transaction, then you could lose these jobs forever. And if these jobs are you know, tantamount to the safe operation of your system and you lose them, then your system doesn't work. And that's a support request, at least. So well, you could do something like, OK, I will queue, I will queue a job, but I will configure my task queue to delay for 200 milliseconds before running any job, and then something, something, something. But these are all ugly workarounds. You shouldn't do them. You should simply design these problems away by not doing this in the first place. Um, yeah, so it may look like this. Like uh, in, in Create you, you don't even bother using a queue, just use spawn. And, well, it probably will work until a certain point when it no longer works and you don't know why, or you may have certain objects that are not in the right state and you don't know why. And then you realize, you realize oh yeah, because last, last year I wrote some code and I used spawn. So, so don't do this. This is not good. Now, well, you can, you can move the job insertion into a transaction. So either you use REPL multi, multi or you, you know, custom code a transaction. So it's copy-paste friendly, but it's maintainer unfriendly. And at the same time, well, if you want to change something, that's still, you know, you have to change in templates or so. Even if you extract it into another module, it's still, you know, templates that you have to call it. It's unwanted complexity, please don't do it. So as an example, this is a reform version of, of, uh, of the bad example. It's still bad. Um, but this time, it's, it's even worse, because now there's a transaction open for the whole time. So it's even worse, because um, you have to recall in Elixir and Erlang applications, um, at, least in, in actual, at least in actual, when you make a database call, if you don't use an explicit transaction, the calls are actually pulled in actual on the statement level. So that's why actual is able to use um, drastically fewer database connections to serve a large amount of you know, incoming, incoming requests, like in Phoenix. 
so that's uh, that's done by eliminating the period uh, the period during which a transaction in the database is open but idle. So idle and waiting in transaction. That's like the worst thing you, you worst thing you can see. And if you check any database or Rails application, you will see plenty. Because in a Rails request, you get a connection right when you first access Active Record, and, and you don't relinquish it ever <laughs> for each thread. So, so if you do this kind of stuff where you insert something in a transaction, but you do it wi within your application, then at least that's one more round trip at least. And if you do some more stuff in that big transaction, you're going to incur more performance penalty. It may not be a problem in the first place, but it will cause you to have to use a large database server at least. Well, so basically the suggestion is you don't do, you don't do it from the application because, well, because of the reasons explained before, you shouldn't do it. People may not know that they have to go through the application. You should treat your database as something that's smarter than a dumb data store and actually properly leverage database. So. One of the examples of using a database-driven job creation procedure would be to use a trigger function and to run it after, after, a job, uh, after something has been committed and a change is interesting enough to warrant a job. Um, there's an article on, on transactional stage job drain, which uh, the idea is write something into a temporary table in the transaction and later use a very big, uh, very big reader writer to refund that temporary table, and for each row taken away from the table, put it into Redis, and then, and then use Psychic to execute them. So, well, the point here is, if you already have it in the database, you might as well just, just leave it in the database. But uh, your system's design constraints may not allow you to do so immediately. So another thing is, even though trigger functions usually are always run, they don't run on replica. Uh, they don't run on replicas. So if you were cheeky and you don't want to have trigger functions fire, maybe you want to circumvent the audit logs, then well, you open up Postgres console, you set session replication role to replica, and magically all of the subsequent operations you do in that specific Postgres session will not trigger uh, any kind of trigger functions, and so it won't it won't kill jobs. Uh, it's not recommended, but if you need an escape hatch, it's available. So yeah, this is how you make a trigger function. So you, cr so you create a um, you create a function first in Postgres. You will notice that basically it's SQL. So in this case, create a function which is called enqueue remove objects it returns a trigger, and I use two dollar signs as as the delimiter and then I wrap uh, the actual code, the body of a function within that. I said, insert into the jobs table values from the old row. Uh, because in this case, it's a trigger that's supposed to be wrong when something has been deleted. Each Postgres trigger gets new and old uh, rows. Uh, of course, creation only has new, deletion only has old, and updates, has, uh, updates have, have like new and old. In this case, a deletion trigger function will only get old, uh, new doesn't exist or it's empty, so you shouldn't use it. So once you have this function in place, you can then create a trigger on the table. You tell Postgres, uh, for, for each row deleted from the documents table, if, if the row originally held a reference to somewhere else, then make a job. So you're able to selectively create a job by doing so uh, directly in the database. You can decide whether the procedure is executed for each row or just once, but uh, for one of tasks, you probably want to stick with for each row, to be honest. Well, the second, second case is uh, charge credit cards whenever somebody buys something. So again, this is a, uh, basically just you know, a very simple function. You create the function, and then you call it. You call it on update to purchases. So the case here is you may have certain database tables that have a status column, and you may tie you may tie certain jobs to certain status transitions. There are many ways to do so. The first way, of course, uh, if you're a hardcore Elixir developer, you will write a state machine, um, either yourself or using existing implementations, and then you you funnel all of your state transitions through a state machine, and a state machine will issue complicated or at least complex or at least compound transactions where it not only changes the status column, it also issues a new job. And, and this is how you can, can do it um, 
can do the equivalent job in, uh, in Postgres directly without having to follow all your changes through the state machine, therefore the application. And um, also notice here, uh, for each row, when new status is processing, so, so that's how you can, you're able to filter, but you're not only limited to filtering by these things, you're also able to call you know, things with side effects here, like uh, if time of, two, like if, if now is like later than 6 p.m. or so. You, you, can, you can totally do that, but just uh, try to keep it simple. Don't, don't do something that's more complicated. Another thing is that you, you will notice that the language here is um, just uh, built in PO, PO SQL, but if you run your own Postgres instance, you can even write in a Ruby if you want to. Again, it's not recommended, but you're able to do so. All right, so now with how to make jobs in place, you can now, you can now consider uh, making an executor. So there are many ways to, to build executors, main, uh, chiefly related to how the concurrency model is set up. So of course, you first can decide, okay, I want a single executor only. I want a single priority of jobs. All your jobs run in a sequence that will receive. This is easiest to make, because that's basically how the general stage consumer is. It just pulls new stuff down, and then it executes all the stuff. But sometimes you may have priorities. So you may decide, I want a single executor. I want multiple priorities. And prioritization of a task can be done you know, dynamically. So there is, you know, I would say there is some kind of controversy as to how it should be done, because uh, you always have very weird cases where your high queue is kind of full, but your low queue is also full, and your application is executing all the high priority jobs for two hours, and all the low priority jobs have not been run for two hours, and suddenly they became high priority now because they haven't been run for two hours. And so that's what, what could happen to your executor if you simply you know, order by priority. So another idea here is you can probably control them also by the maximum tolerable latency, i.e. each high task should be run within a minute, each low task should be run within 20 minutes. And in that case, you will have to run some of the lower priority jobs um, in the same place as, as the higher ones, but at least you won't, uh, you won't cause the worst case latency to spike. So, well, you can also have multiple executors each having a single priority or multiple executors each having multiple priorities and it gets even more complicated from there. So another thing you want to think about is whether, whether you have some kind of sharing of the jobs table. So at least in the real world, there's something called delay jobs. The delay jobs gem uh, creates a delay jobs table and anything Anything that's a job gets created as a row in that table or as a tuple in that table. So that's what, uh, that's what a share everything approach is compared to a share no sharing approach where each kind of task is created in a different table. Well, just to prefix it, uh, in Postgres, you can create some kind of table as a template table. So you create jobs template, and then you specify, I want an ID, I want inserted add, I want, re I want retried add, I want something, something else. And then you can tell Postgres, now I want a jobs table for this type of jobs, based a structure entirely on that particular table. And you're able to basically do that. It's like copy and paste in DDL. So by doing that, you don't have to specify the same thing over and over again. And you can still kind of guarantee that the underlying columns that you need for execution is always there. And um, you can do it with inheritance or do it without inheritance. I, I do suggest doing it without inheritance, but if you do it with inheritance and you query, and, and you query from a jobs table, you can actually see all the child, like all the child tables. Anyway, so the no-sharing approach probably is more complex, but it has better isolation, it has, better con uh, it has much lower contention, so robustness is okay. So imagine a case where suddenly you have something creating a huge amount of jobs. If you don't have, if you don't have a, uh, if you don't have isolation between different types of jobs, then your jobs table will become extremely busy. And that is a bad thing because now it impacts all the other jobs. So I know we probably want to talk about Redis again, but Redis is single threaded. So, so it's our the question. Yeah. So in case of no sharing, uh, well, each table can be read by a different executor, for example. So really, you can scale them, you can scale them independently if needed. And if you run your own Postgres and you find that this table is particularly hot, um, you can do some, some magic and you move the table to a different table space and use a faster disk. 
if you can't move all of them to a faster disk, you can do that kind of magic. And if you already have separation by tables, and you replace, uh, you move one table, then only that table is now available for a while, and the rest will be available, so it's better. But if you only have one big table and that fails, then you're in trouble. Another thing that's, uh, that's also important is that with dedicated tables, you're able to use database features like actual domains and actual types. So in Postgres, you can, you can specify, I have a string which needs to be two characters, which need to be all uppercase, uh, you can specify that kind of constraint and then associate it with a type which uh, gets you a domain. And you can actually use these things if you have separated tables. If you don't, then you can't use these things because everything will have to be serialized as a very big blob of JSON or something else. So there's no, there's no type safety. Well, so how, how, would you, how would you do this? Uh, the proposed architecture, at least uh, for, it, for the context of this talk, is that, well, use multiple gen stage pipelines, one for each executor. So the thing that's responsible for ingestion gets one pipeline. The thing that's responsible for uploads gets another one. The thing that's responsible for messaging people, at least sending stuff to, Phoenix, uh, to, to the Phoenix transport layer, gets another pipeline. And each pipeline will only have one single priority, which means that they pull down stuff from, from their own tables and they just do stuff. So in this case, you don't have complicated uh, reprioritization logic duplicated within each producer because that's um, probably not tenable. So the question is, so how do you ensure that pipelines scale properly? The answer is you probably can do it by adding another layer of interaction but on the other side, which is uh, you can add something called an orchestrator. Again, this is a proposal, so I think so. Maybe maybe it's not accurate, but this may work. So the role of the orchestrator is to look at how many tasks are remaining and what are the deadline characteristics of each type of task, and as a result, which pipeline gets how many slots available that they can they can generate how much demand. So it kind of balances total capable demand against uh, total addressable demand. So in that case, each pipeline will need to be able to specify, for example, this particular pipeline I'm running in as a document upload pipeline currently sees 20 jobs. Each job takes one unit of work. And uh, for, each, uh, for each unit of delay, uh, I, may, uh, I may lose X units of work or so on. So each pipeline should be able to expose a standardized uh, piece of information like that, which allows the orchestrator to make certain decisions. All right. Well, that only happens if, uh, if you run out of servers, because otherwise you can always add new servers. So now let's talk about actually populating the, the executor and therefore the pipelines. Well, obligatory gen stage announcement is that, well, fulfilling initial demand is very easy. Each consumer starts with some kind of demand size. You either set it or it's set automatically for you. So when a gen stage, cons uh, when a gen stage consumer is created, it automatically asks the, the producer at least whatever is upstream for, for this much. You may have that much, you may not. But no matter what, at a certain point in time, you're, you're bound to run out because you may have no more tasks for the consumer at that moment. In this case, you will have something called unmet demand. So the unmet demand needs to be made, uh, needs to be fulfilled at a later stage. If you don't fulfill these unmet demands, then, well, your consumer will, re will refuse to generate more demand. So, so you need to fulfill these demands later. And, well, there's a naive way to do it, which is, Okay, if I have unmet demand and I don't have any more talks, and I go to sleep for n seconds and then wake up and grab a query for this much uh, for this much uh, work that I can grab from the database, and if I got all of that fulfilled, then I schedule another tick after n seconds. Uh, otherwise, I will sleep for longer because maybe the system is now a little bit quiet. I can afford to sleep for longer and not create unnecessary traffic, something like that. Um, but of course, in this situation, uh, the problem will be, so what happens to a job that was created between, uh, between poles? The answer is they will be processed a little bit later than necessary. So the worst case latency will be, well, the maximum processing time plus the maximum amount of jitter plus uh, the polling interval, I think. Um, 
that probably will still be fine for your use case, but it probably will not be fine. So it's a case where after a long day at work, you go home, and next day you come in at 8 a.m. and you pull down your development page, and it's very slow. And you found out the reason was because the web service ha has already retired the underlying application process and has to be warmed out again. That's exactly the same feeling you will get. So uh, one of the solutions available is to tell Postgres to tell you when there is additional work. You can use it by utilizing asynchronous notifications or in Postgres commands, listen and notify. According to Postgres documentation, these are not part of the ISO standard, but they are nonetheless available to you. And you can also use it today using Postgres. So each notification, at least according to Postgres, is a tuple of topic and payload. So, well, you may think, okay, I'll put the content of a new job of a new job directly in the payload and Postgres will push it to me and I got a pop stop service. Well, that probably won't be a good idea, but I'll explain later. So in this case, I make I made a new function, which is still a trigger. So in this trigger I actually call PG notify. So I notify on the topic new job and I actually did that. I I, I told Postgres Take this row in a database and don't, uh, you know, just convert it to JSON. Use row to JSON and then cast it again to text, because when you when you do row to JSON, you get you get a JSON type and then a text type. And PG Notify wants a text type, so you want to be polite and just cast it to text. And if you do this, then essentially, uh, then you hook it up with the uh, with the after insertion trigger, because you don't uh, you don't want jobs that were updated, you know, to come back to you maybe. Then you can listen to it in your Elixir application. Finally, Elixir code. So you actually ask the repo, what's your configuration? And then you override the pool size uh, to one because you only need one connection. And then you, you grab the configuration, you take the channel name, you tell Postgres, start a start listener, and then start listening to this particular channel. And then, well, if you're using a joint server, you probably want to receive, do you want to handle info? But, but the idea is that Postgres will send you notifications with five item tuples, so notification from which PID, what reference, what channel, what payload, and then you can, you can handle this, pay, this payload, so your producer can then decide, okay, I will wake up from my slumber and grab, this, grab a task and start doing stuff. Well, there are certain caveats in this, just like all things database related. The first thing, of course, is if you have, haven't read Postgres source code, you probably want to read it because it's very enlightening, and it actually tells you certain things that, uh, that maintainers haven't documented or thought not, were not necessary to document. For example, if a file database is on the same database instance, and they all use notifications, there's only a single global queue for all notifications. So there's going to be contention. And if you have, you know, a lot of listeners listening for notifications, the thing is, each listener backend when started tells Postgres, I am a listener, this is my PID. But it doesn't say anything else. It doesn't say anything regarding what topics we're listening to. So anytime anything was sent from that asynchronous notification infrastructure, it is copied and sent to all listeners, all listening backends, and each backend decides, okay, is this my database, and discards if not, and then is this a topic I'm interested in, and discard if not, and then finally sends it to your application. So you may not see the, the impact in your application, but the impact is definitely there. It's, uh, there's a lot of churn in there if you use more than your share, basically. Also, there's another thing which, uh, which you probably will run into, but you will only run into it if you do some very naughty things, which is the maximum size of a payload in a Postgres notification is capped by certain internal mechanisms, like the size of a page that's, uh, that's vended by Postgres's simple, least recently used cache system. And you can still tease it out somehow, but usually it's probably probably constant. So in this case, um, in this case, in order to read this query, you look at first you look at general series. General series is a function that when you call, it will generate from from one to seven thousand nine hundred ninety nine. So it will generate seven seven thousand nine hundred ninety nine rows, and each row will have a number. And then I use uh, Basically, I change, them, I change these rows, cast them to 7,999 A's, and then concatenate them together. So I have a payload which is 7,999 bytes long, at least according to octet length. And then I try to use that with PG Notify, and it works. But if I were to add one more byte, it would tell me payload string is too long. So imagine this happening in your trigger function. You probably wouldn't be able to debug it. So be careful not to send payloads that are too large and try to keep the payload as small as possible as well. Another thing that Postgres does is if you send the same notification with the same topic and the same payload multiple times in the same transaction, only one is sent. So that could be an optimization factor. Anyway, um, lastly, handling errors and timeouts. 
So this is something that uh, you would have talked about in, er in an earlier section on designing your tiles and classifying them. So when things go, round, go wrong, you probably want to have some kind of logs as to how things were wrong things went wrong in the first place. So usually what you want is really a stack trace, like an error report and a stack trace, really. So, well, if you're familiar with Elixir, Elixir has this task uh, structure, and you can use task yield to wait for a task for a maximum amount uh, of X seconds, for example, and then, you know, return cut short if the task is still running. So what you can then do is you combine that with process info. So you wait for a task to run maximum of 30 seconds. If it still hasn't completed, first get a stack trace, then kill the task. Don't do it in an opposite manner because it won't work. So first get a stack trace, uh, the current stack trace of that task, find out what is it waiting on, and then kill it. And you can grab the stack trace and put it elsewhere. So this can be done by using nested tasks. The reason is that you may, you may do this for a consumer, and the consumer needs to be flowing all the time. You need, need to be available to messages. So it runs a task which creates another tasks, uh, task and monitors it. So <laughs> it's kind of a, kind of a uh, nested structure, but later I'll have a chart that shows it. And well, you can use this, uh, this kind of utility to grab the current stack trace and then, to, and then to format it for easy reading. You may want to format it anyway, because otherwise it's, uh, it's not all strings. So it will look uh, kind of like this, where you have the consumer pulling from producer, you have multiple runners at once, and each runner creates a worker task, and the worker task actually runs code, and you can decide where to put these tasks under, under your own task supervisor or under elsewhere. All right, so lastly, periodic tasks. In certain cases, you have periodic tasks, like you know, take all the rubbish or delete all the files that have not been looked at for 30 days. These things usually come, uh, need, to, need to have a driving query to accompany them. Like you have to actually write a query and execute the query to find out how many resources were, being, uh, were to be impacted. And they potentially also generate a large amount of data, like if it's a daily reporting task. They, however, have much looser deadlines. Yeah, a few examples for you. So when dealing with these tasks, uh, several considerations. First, if a task runs over its uh, allotted amount of time, what do you do? Do you run it again? Do you kill it? Do you cancel the next one? So depending on your business context, uh, you may actually find different solutions, uh, and you have to tweak them. Another thing is, if you schedule everything to be run at the beginning of an hour, you will have some kind of thundering herd problem, where if you look at your system utilization metrics, the first few minutes of each hour, you will see heightened usage of all resources, and then it goes back to normal. So you see peaks, and you can, you can just count the peaks to count how many hours your system has been up. So, so ideally, what you want to do is to either you know, shift the workload around, so still run it every hour, but instead of the first minute, run it like between the first and the 10th minute. Or another thing would be still run it, but vary the amount of time elapsed between runs. So it depends on what the characteristic of the underlying periodic task is. You have multiple ways to solve this problem of concentrated resource utilization. So it looks very similar to, to the other chart because that's how you do a periodic task. And you know, just like in this case, I use a single gen server, but you can easily slot a gen stage in if you really want to. Okay, so now we talk about regulating the use of uh, expensive resources. Um, I'll just give you a few examples here, like these are resources that are not easily replenishable. For example, host resources, CPU or memory, and one thing that people may, forgot, uh, may forget is disk. Um, if you run all of these, then your service will degrade and sometimes heighten latency, sometimes heighten error rate. Sometimes you have a third-party service you have to call. If you go over a limit, you degrade your service or you get a big bill. Sometimes you have expensive uh, conversion or processing process that you just have to have everything pushed through. So you have to kind of regulate the access to that process lest uh, you get priority inversion issues. Uh, lastly, this is something that's related, which is if your system actually is too fast, you could end up sending too many things to your end users and make them unhappy because it's too fast. So there are 
many approaches uh, which you can take to regular usage of resources. Sometimes you know, you know how much resources a task is going to use before running it, sometimes you don't. Um, an example that you know beforehand is if you were to download a file, a good w web server would tell you how large a file is before it sends you the rest of the data. So you could kind of wait until you have that amount of disk space and then you reserve it and then you, start con you continue to download. Or you can probably do it with an, an, uh, a head request and then a get request later. You could totally do that, but of course you'll have to spend cycles teasing, teasing these constraints out. The, the upside is that you don't have to just blindly retry everything. You can actually can guarantee, almost guarantee that the jobs queued in your system will get run eventually. And also sometimes it's not a fault of your task execution system, but how you, re how you present the results. So maybe if your task execution system sends a lot of notifications and it's very fast, then what you want to do is you have a buffering area where you buffer all the notifications for one day and it sends and it's an outbatched uh, in one day periods, which is not a periodic task, but again, this makes users happier. So there are some other ways that you can use to regulate external processes, like you can use NAS, you can use CPU limits, and that's fine. And sometimes you want to also restart certain processes by the number of times it has run, and that's also fine. So another thing you, you might think about is, well, how do, you mod how do you model use of discrete and also non-discrete resources? So discrete is a simple part, you know, just count the number of things that you can use. And you can use a connection pool, this is easy. How about non-discrete bits, like CPU time, memory, or disk? You can still regulate them in the same manner though, just you have to decide on the unit of separation. So maybe for disk you use 100 megabyte increments, so you have four gigabytes and you have 40 things. So if you were to download a file which is one gigabyte, then you need the downloader to claim 10 to 10, claim 10 of that, uh, 10 of these things. And then once you have 10, then you can download. It's um, basically a bin packing problem. So uh, again, with Poolboy, it's easy. You know, each consumer gets a worker. That's that's the easy part. And another thing is you can use something called S-Broker. So S-Broker written by Mr. James Fish, another way of regulating resource use. It actually has two queues. One using the, uh, one using, uh, the Caudill algorithm and another one using a timer algorithm. It tries to match providers and it tries to match producers and consumers, so to say. You may find that a little bit superior to pool boy in certain cases. And of course, if you have unequally sized consumers, you can always have one consumer request multiple bits of resources. Okay, now, further ideas on monitoring. So the motivation is that you want to know which executor is causing delays. Um, you can't just count the number of tasks because some executors are very high volume and they're also very efficient. Counting the number of tasks is a poor metric. It doesn't actually afford you enough information to scale your executors correctly. What you really want to see is, you know, size of a queue, latency and also how much time a task has spent waiting in the queue waiting to be executed. These are the important bits. So you, you, want, to, you want to measure all these bits. Also, th there's another motivation, which is you really do need uh, good metrics to enable good auto scaling. But I'll talk about auto scaling in a bit. So the suggested approach here is you can probably just you know, have every single text executor report and you probably use Exometer. And each metric can be accompanied with host name, but in this case, it would probably be process name at, a, at host IP or something else. But anyway, the host name will, be, will allow you to separate uh, executors uh, on different hosts. And you aggregate the metrics and you push them to CloudWatch and you push them to other monitoring solutions and then you have it in one place, which is nice. So you really want to watch latency, watch your queue time, and watch your processing time. Also watch your error rates if you want to, and watch the number of retries. Because if something retries three times constantly, then maybe, uh, maybe it, needs to, it needs to have its uh, frequency increased. So it doesn't hit the, uh, the outgoing thing so frequently. Throughput probably matters, but really it doesn't really matter that much because really what matters is latency of, uh, of each task. Okay, now this is the important bit, <laughs> scaling, scaling task systems. So in scaling task systems, I'll talk about three different aspects, scaling Elixir nodes, scaling Postgres, and scaling the infrastructure. The key thing here is that, well, scaling Elixir nodes is good. There are several ways you 
several reasons why you want to scale. Maybe you want to protect against the failure of a certain host. You want to protect against exhaustion of a certain host's resources by having more hosts. You probably want to try and find a way to ensure that certain customers have a certain quality of service, and you can't really do that if you don't have enough resources. Or probably you don't want to write app ups and roll ups, and you don't want to mutate your hosts. So this time you want to do roll the updates. But in order to do that, you actually have to have a way to dynamically replace uh, a fraction of your cluster with new nodes that are running new versions of the code when you want to. So that's the motivation. How do you do it? Do three things. First, prepare infrastructure. So, um, so networking traffic between Beam and instances can be sent and received. This usually means that uh, EPMD port has to be open, and the port range for a lot distribution has to be open, and, and so on. Then you can establish your cluster. It needs to be dynamic. There are many ways to find the peers, uh, which I'll elaborate later. And then you distribute the work. So, well, if you want to find peers, there are many, many ways to find peers, uh, especially if you're, wor uh, if you're working with Amazon Web Services, there are so many ways. And if, if you're not, then you probably have access to UDP multicast, and you can just use that. So that's the easy part. Uh, the thing here is you really want to find a way to distribute work either evenly or unevenly, but most importantly for the one-off but ordered execution, zero tasks, or actually for periodic tasks, in these cases, you probably will need to find some kind of a natural boundary between, between customers or between accounts in your system. Once you've found that kind of boundary, you can then use that as a basis upon which you separate, uh, you separate work groups and, and distribute work. So the thing here is you can totally abuse Swarm to do this, uh, basically standing on the shoulders of giants. Uh, in short, Swarm advertises itself as something that distributes processes based on a consistent hashing algorithm. So each process has a name, name gets hashed, and, and the hash tells you where in the ring it lives, and then, the, and then each node that's alive gets a chunk of that ring, so each node will run these processes, and so on and so on. So the key thing here is that the Swarm worker itself actually doesn't need to do any work. The only, only purpose of the worker being on that particular node is to tell other things on that node that it is there. And this is the beauty of it, because this means that your system can scale from one server to many servers without, you know, without significant changes, simply by adding Swarm there. So here's how, how, how it works. The node starts up. Each node runs all the pipelines, but the pipelines are empty, and they're not pulling data. The reason is our producers are all configured to pull nothing, to pull data for no accounts. Each node joins the Erlang cluster. Each node boots up, joins the Swarm cluster. Each node also runs a custom process called, called Enforcer. So what's the Enforcer? Enforcer is a custom process that, that we wrote. So it solves a problem where if you bring the cluster hard down and then book it back up, then no cluster node will have any memory at all because all the disk storage is ephemeral and you, you're not going to store any of your database, will you? So there is no existing state. You have to recreate state. So the enforcer basically select ID from accounts and it grabs a list of account IDs and then and it tells Swarm, basically goes through the IDs one by one. Where is your worker for this account? If it's there in Swarm, then, then it assumes that it's running. And if it's not an it tells Swarm, start a worker for this account. And Swarm will then put it in the ring, and then it will, the worker will pop up on the correct node. So that's essentially how it works. So yeah, it's a polar, basically. It's a polar wrap around in a simple Swarm call. It uses Swarm where is. So where is this name? If it's not defined, then register it. How do you register? You first find a Swarm supervisor, and then you tell Swarm, register this name against this supervisor, call the, call the function register with the argument name. If it's already registered, do nothing. If it's OK, then OK. If the rest, then crash. So the Swarm supervisor, um, it's simple one-for-one -one supervisor. It's really very simple. So you know, it has a worker. It has a register convenience function. And the worker itself is where the fun is. So the worker gets started. It finds a target for a scope. In this case, the worker may have a scope of accounts. So it's a worker that represents work for an account. And it will be created on only one of the nodes in the cluster. So 
it finds a target, in this case a producer responsible for you know, producing account-related work, and then tell, it monitors the producer first, so if a producer goes down there, worker gets killed, and it tells the producer, add this account ID to your list. So start producing work for this particular account, and then later on, uh, the worker joins Swarm, but uses first and after self joins zero. So basically, it happens more or less immediately. When joins it equals Swarm join. So the worker is very simple. If Swarm tells the worker, now is your time to hand off work to other nodes, it would just you know tell the producer, I'm out. Doesn't do anything else. And it doesn't resolve conflicts at all. Because it doesn't need to, because there's no, there's no, really no particular state in that thing. And when it dies, it just dies. But if it gets a down notification, like from from the producer crashing, if a producer were to crash, then it would just exit violently, kill itself, basically. And that is good enough. So each producer has a has a map set. A map set is a kind of a a set. So you can you can check the uh, membership of something in a map set, and then well, if membership isn't there, then add it. So when the producer needs to produce work, it can then use the content of a map set to grab the relevant IDs uh, of accounts, and then you know grab the work only intended for these accounts. Now, second bit: scaling Postgres. So. Everybody knows that Postgres needs, ver uh, needs a good horizontal scaling story. The maximum concentration ratio of how many app servers versus how many database servers is really limited. Um, and at some point in the future, you will run into a bottleneck. Well, the good news is that Postgres 10 is out, and you know these dividends, like I can take some customers offline, take some, uh, remain, have some remain off online. I don't need to have global outages. I can have partial or you know, even just rolling outages or even no outages at all or I can put this customer on a super duper server in order to ensure they don't go down, or so on. These are the those patients. And these will come true. Because uh, although there are already multiple implementations out there, if you really can't wait, you really can go out and grab some of them. Can uh, Enterprise DB has something. You can, you can get a free trial. You can do Postgres Excel. You can use PG Partman. Some of them use the multi-master approach. Some of them don't. But the idea is you probably want to want to see if you can wait until the multi-master approach actually matures, because work is happening in Postgres using foreign data wrappers. So, well, you can pretend also when when you scale Postgres, you can pretend to have a single database only, or you know it has a bunch of problems, or you can actually have multiple Postgres instances directly accessed by the database. So the thing here is you can use writable views or you know views that have rules instead of updates and instead of and instead of inserts to insert content into particular shards. Or you can use an aggregate table built 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 from many foreign tables, or you can use partitions. There are many ways to solve this problem, but you know they are kind of fiddly and they hide the actual complexity from your application. You probably don't want to do that. The good news is shard management will be added to the partitioning syntax, which was added in Postgres 10. According to the presentation, the future of Postgres sharding presented in April 2017 and updated in March 2018. So I think it's coming soon. And if you can afford to wait, it probably is very much worth waiting for it. Yeah, so in the meantime, you probably have to do something like this, which is a bit uglier. But at least if it fails, you know how, how it failed, and it's very obvious. So you may want to add a master database, but that's for, for later. It's just not mer very material. On infrastructure side, though, again, I already talked about what metrics are important. The thing here that you need to keep in mind is when you scale, you should scale based on the resource usage of the host resources, not based on latency. Adding more servers to something that's already late probably won't make it better. You have to ensure that you can actually scale and make, make a positive impact based on scaling. And my understanding is that you probably have to always base it on, on a perspective of whether the host is you know, saturated. Also, don't take away your service regulation, like only 100 API calls to the service globally, something like that. You probably still want to keep it in. If you take it away, bad things will happen. So well, you normalize it a bit, and then you tell Amazon what to do, and then it does it for you. <laughs> so in the future, well, we did, we did a bunch of that stuff, but that was on and off uh, while we were creating our product. Uh, so far, the product worked. 
but uh, there are some things that I think uh, would be useful to see in the future. One of the things that I, I think will be useful is to find a way natively in Swarm to define, uh, or say to in Swarm to define how the workers have to be packed onto hosts. Like some hosts should be able to claim more of uh, more chunks from the virtual ring, and some may be able to claim uh, fewer chunks from, from from the ring. Maybe this is wrong, and we should just use the same type of host all, all the way. But having that support surface will be good because there is support for it in like 50% of Swarm and it's not exposed. So maybe it's coming, maybe it's not. Yeah. Um, also, we're working on some kind of a unifying, unifying framework really just to have a single way of, ac uh, of accessing all these things from a single library without having to copy and paste all the time. So now what we have done was we have already created a shared, a shared module that can be included in the producers. We haven't done the orchestrator because there was no need yet, but I believe at a certain point in the future we will start needing uh, the services of, of the orchestrator, which can look at all the queues, look at how busy they are, and, and then you know separate work among all, all producers at least within the scope of a certain node. So there, these are the references uh, that I found very useful when creating this talk. And there, there are some Elixir and Erlang repositories, some of them are just, uh, I have links and uh, link them here. So when the slides are released, you can, you can read them. And thanks again for your time today.